Uh, I you can get an idea here <coughs> of some of the equipment. You've seen a lot of it already. But uh, 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 no, that, that's, yeah, go back to the other one. Uh, you've seen a lot of it already, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll see more of it. But you can see rollers back here. You can see um, you know, uh, trucks and material transfer devices. Go ahead. This is what uh, the project looked like uh, uh, during the course of construction when we, we had to build it, uh, uh, the westbound lane one year, the eastbound lane the other year. So obviously, uh, in order to do that, <coughs> you had to have two-way traffic on one lane for a while. So we had to put concrete barriers out, which we did uh, ourselves. Uh, we, we do uh, a great deal of the construction all ourselves. Um, we sub out only really what is required to be subbed. Um, we had to put these light reflectors so headlights would not uh, shine in the other lane. Uh, we laid the asphalt. This is the rumble strip that is required and, uh, and that's actually cut in there uh, by a, a, a small machine called a rotomill. And, uh, and it goes down the pavement and it cuts, 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 cuts. So if, uh, if automobiles or trucks start to veer off, they hit that and makes a noise and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wake you guys back up again or something like that. Is that done while you dry or? Uh, no, it, it's done after it's all, all cold and hard. So that's, that is an expensive operation. We do subcontract that out. Those are, there'd be a series of diamond blades you know, for you know, 12 to 18 inches wide, so it's an expensive operation. And How that did the uh, um, alignment? I mean, they're perfectly aligned. Uh, that's that's all done electronically. Laser uh, uh, they uh, they would in this particular instance, you can see here's the edge of the pavement. They would have some kind of a, a, a laser or electronic um, a guiding device that would guide off this edge of pavement. And then here's part of that shoulder stone. I said there were 90,000 tons of various kinds of stone out on the job, and that was part of it. Uh, oh, just go back a second. Uh, this is a good example. This asphalt is considerably different than that asphalt. Um, uh, this asphalt is some of that steel slag asphalt, extremely high quality, made with, uh, with polymer liquid asphalt, some of this that has polymers in it. This over here, which uh, would not have traffic on it on a daily basis, is a much less expensive asphalt, has less asphalt content, and so you can see the difference in the color. So we don't, we don't put color in it at all. That's just because those are different kinds of asphalt. Go ahead. Do you give for five minutes break or something? Yeah, oh, that's fine, yeah. So oh, no, it's whatever. Do you need care for five minutes break? Yeah, why don't we just take a five minute break? That's okay. fine, I could get a drink of water. Um, to digress just um, just a little bit, uh, um, you know, I'm I'm talking an awful lot about asphalt, um, but um, last year uh, our company probably had more volume in concrete work than we did in asphalt work. Uh, if if you guys and gals think about a box culvert. And we build a lot of box culverts. We're we're doing uh, doing uh, uh, some to you know as we speak, uh, but one of which we built last year was about 300 feet long. It was about uh, uh, 30 feet wide, and and of course it it had uh, it was what we call a three barrel. In other words, there were three sections. So you pour a concrete floor, you pour the outside walls, you pour the interior walls, and you pour a uh, uh, a roof on top, and then of course you pour, pour the wing walls, which uh, which are out from uh, from either end of it. Uh, but that's just like concrete construction. If you were building a home that had a had or a commercial building that had the first floor concrete, you'd do it exactly the same. And those people that build our bridges and our box culverts are carpenter foremen. We, uh, we have two supervisors or superintendents that came up through the ranks, uh, through the union ranks, as, um, uh, as carpenters. 
and uh, they were, you know, carpenters and then carpenter foremen, and now they're carpenter superintendents, and they're the ones that build our bridges and our box covered. So, uh, so we buy a lot of lumber. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, at one point in time, we were buying form lumber uh, in railroad car lots. Uh, and we build uh, a significant amount of bridges uh, every single year. And again, uh, from the, one of the early pictures that you saw uh, of, the, of the steel, I was pointing out, but if you looked at all the lumber, uh, all that's form lumber because you've got to form the bottom in order to pour uh, the concrete deck. Can you reuse that form lumber? Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, you, uh, a big part of a, a project uh, carpenter foreman or a project supervisor uh, is, to, uh, uh, is to figure out what he can do uh, uh, with a four by eight sheet of plywood so he can salvage that. Um, you know, if, if he goes out here and he could, I don't know, lay it this way and be able to salvage the whole thing, but he decides to lay it this way and he has to cut it up into four pieces. We can't use those four pieces any longer. So he's really increased the cost of, of what he's doing. So, so the way he plans his forming is very important. Uh, the, the, what we call the stringers underneath, uh, we use a lot of double, uh, double two by sixes, double four by fours, a lot of double two by eights. Um, and, and the way he, you know, if you're buying two by eights and you're doubling them, and then you're cutting those up into small pieces, we can't use those any longer. So it really makes a difference. Maybe it's cheaper to go out and actually buy four by fours. Uh, you go uh, down in this area, uh, we have, uh, still have lumber mills south of here down by Clay City, and we'll buy rough cut four by fours. Those are a lot cheaper than putting in uh, uh, you know, double two by fours or, or uh, 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 actually even cheaper than double two by sixes. So, so your forming costs depend a lot on your raw material and, and you better believe we try to salvage as much of that as we possibly can. Um, the, uh, uh, let's, let's go on. Um, uh, this is some of the testing on the job site. Um, um, when we lay asphalt, we lay it hot and we roll it uh, immediately because we have to get a certain density. In other words, we test these in our lab, but we test them out there. And if, if it is not a certain density, then it, it's not going to have uh, the longevity that we want. Just like your concrete, if for some reason it doesn't uh, reach the strength that you want, then you've got big problems, particularly if you're building a skyscraper. You know, you're up on the 30th floor, and all of a sudden, your, your, uh, your strength of that concrete drops down below, probably below 4,000 PSI. You're in, big, you're in big trouble. And the same thing with, with asphalt. We've got to know that we're achieving density, or the state can make us come in and take it up and, and replace it. This is a nuclear density meter. You see the, our, our man here has got a dosimeter that he wears. Well, that's, no, that's probably his cell phone, but he, he will be wearing the dosimeter. Uh, he's uh, had training. And, uh, uh, and the reason that we lay out a pattern across the map this way is we want to make sure that that density is consistent all the way across there. We also want to make sure that that density is consistent right at the center line. Um, if you drive down a roadway uh, and you see problems with a pavement, whether it's asphalt or concrete, probably initially it's going to be right on the center line. Uh, watch that if you, uh, if you have an opportunity. And if you start seeing the uh, spalling here uh, in the concrete or pieces of asphalt breaking out, what that means is water is what it means is that this probably was not consolidated well enough during the time of construction. Water begins to get down in here and then it starts breaking from the bottom up. Uh, and so it's very, very important that you know what the densities are across, across that mat. Go this ahead. Thing yeah, what uh, really it's just, it's mineral filler, just like cement dust. Uh, when, when this machine 
uh, and it, it's a nuclear device, so actually what it's doing is kind of like a, uh, I guess kind of like sonar in the Navy. It, 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 shoots, um, it shoots rays down into the surface and then it measures them when they bounce back up again into the machine. Uh, uh, we found over the years that a lot of times the uh, porousness of the very, very top surface. In other words, this porousness right there will affect the reading. So what you want to do is just fill those, because this porousness here has nothing to do with the consolidation down here. So we'll fill that with, with some of that white powder uh, mineral filler in order to, uh, to do that. This is a way of testing uh, the smoothness. When we lay an asphalt pavement, uh, uh, or a concrete pavement for that matter, there are various types of testing devices. This is one form. Some of them are pulled behind a pickup truck. Uh, the very, very sophisticated ones that uh, some of the state agencies now have are actually mounted in vans, and they have lasers at all four corners, and they can, uh, can run down a roadway at uh, 50 miles an hour and test the smoothness. No, this actually is just walked. This is not a self-propelled unit. This is a computer up here, and uh, and this is a printer and a and a uh, this is a laptop. If you see it, uh, there's another picture. I think. Go ahead. Uh, there we go. And uh, and and this measures, and then it comes off here just like a, if you've been to a doctor, an electrocardiogram. You know, it comes off with a with a uh, a thing here that will measure the uh, uh, measure the the roughness of the pavement. Uh, now, let me just show you, this was kind of interesting. While we were down there building Interstate 70, uh, a, uh, one of the, the laborers came up and he had some photographs of when Route 40 was built originally in the 1920s. Uh, Route 40 uh, was the major highway that I guess was built all the way from the East Coast to the West Coast. And, uh, and it was the first probably public uh, roadway that uh, that went coast to coast, and look at look at these guys. You know, some of them have coats and ties on, and and these were the kinds of uh, of uh, uh, piece of equipment that they used back in the 1920s. Go ahead to the next one. 